All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our Outdoor Florida webinar presented by the Office of Greenways and Trails. Today, we are joined by two guest speakers to talk about protecting and promoting cultural and historic sites that are part of our public trails and greenways here in Florida. And of course, that goes along with March being Florida Archaeology Month. Barbara Clark will be getting us started, and she is the Northwest and North Central Region Director of the Florida Public Archaeology Network, and she holds a bachelor's degree in anthropology and a master's degree in both archaeology and heritage, as well as public administration. Barbara is a registered professional archaeologist and currently serves on many boards and committees within her profession. Her favorite areas of expertise include advocacy at the state and local level, historic cemeteries, and disaster planning. Our second speaker, Anissa Kareem, is the operations manager at the Randell Research Center, which is the managing entity of the Calusa Heritage Trail, located on Pine Island near Fort Myers. Anissa has a bachelor's and master's degree in wildlife ecology and conservation, and she helped to develop the curriculum for the Florida Master Naturalist Program. Before accepting her current role with the Florida Museum of Natural History's Randell Research Center in 2021, she worked for the Lee County Department of Parks and Recreation as a biologist and then as a manager overseeing 17,000 acres of conservation land. So we are so excited to have both of these ladies here today speaking about cultural and historical sites on trails. Um, and I do want to say at the end of our two presentations, we will have time for some questions from our audience. Um, so please do hold your questions until the very end. You can also put them in the chat as we go if you want, and we will read them at the end. Um, and just a reminder, our webinar is being recorded today, so if you have to leave early, then we will be sending out that recording and you'll be able to watch the full presentation on the Florida State Parks YouTube channel. Um, and with that, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So Barbara, if you'd like to share your screen, the floor is yours. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, there we go. So I am going to be using subtitles today. I have never tried this before. Um, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but not, my name is Barbara Clark, and I am with the Florida Public Archaeology Network, otherwise known as FPAN. And today I'm going to start off by introducing what FPAN is, in case some of you are not aware. It's a great resource. And then we're going to go into talking a little bit about archaeology and trails and how to interpret them, uh, considerations for interpreting them, and kind of just the basic do's and don'ts, and then some of the resources that we have available to you all. <clears throat> so if you're not familiar with FPAN, uh, we are a statewide organization, and our mission includes conducting public outreach and education, doing things like we're doing here today. We also provide assistance to local governments. So if you work for a local municipality, we are here for you if you come across issues regarding ordinances, historic preservation ordinances, including archaeology protections in your ordinances. If you come across any issues with sites or cemeteries, anything like that, we are here for you. And we also support the Florida Division of Historical Sources, which is the statewide um, entity that is tasked with protecting our cultural heritage. So we have offices throughout the state. We are a program of the University of West Florida, but we have offices hosted by University of South Florida, Florida Atlantic University, and Flagler College. So if you go on our website, which is fpan.us, you can find which office is closest to you, and that would be who you would contact if you had any issues or anything like that. So we are not regulatory. We can't enforce any rules. Uh, I always tell people we can't enforce the rules, but we educate people about why those rules exist. Um, so the whole idea is that with education comes appreciation, which comes preservation. And so we're here to kind of set the groundwork for that um, through the work that we do throughout the state. So getting started about, trails, which is why we're all here. Um, 
first of all, I love Florida's trails. I think we have some of the best trails in the country um, and such a great network of them. And what's really interesting about Florida is the vast uh, types of the various types of environments that we have, and that is conducive to various cultural aspects. Um, people have lived in Florida for a very long time. And learning about the people who may have used those trails or that people may have resided alongside those trails, even before those trails existed, helps provide a sense of place to our visitors. Also, that creates a sense of pride and a sense of ownership if you have people that use the trail regularly or maybe uh, you know, come down annually as a lot of folks do and stay for a while. That sense of ownership or pride leads to them self-policing the trail. Um, you'll, I've been on trails and I found people, you know, picking up trash and things like that, not because someone told them to, but because they take that ownership, they take it on, on themselves. The great thing about interpreting sites along trails is that it provides a meeting place, a resting place, a place for people who may not necessarily want to trek across the entire trail, a place for them to go and utilize that trail. It also gives us something that uh, we can advertise instead of just the trail itself. We can say, you can come learn about this or that. Um, so it's interesting because it broadens the usership of the trail. It also provides for education about the integration of natural and cultural environments, right? People a long time ago utilized nature probably much more than we do today for their survival. And educating them about that is always really interesting and it draws a different audience. So it broadens the usership of your trail. And then of course, there's the social, the economic and the environmental benefits. Uh, heritage tourism is one of the fastest growing segments of the tourism industry in Florida, and it has been that way for at least a decade. So the people that come to visit these heritage sites are spending more money. They usually have more disposable income. They usually stay a little bit longer. A lot of them are repeat visitors. And so this has an ep economic benefit outside of the trail. It's supporting the local communities and businesses as well. So I think that's important to remember. And I've also uh, read studies that say people that come to visit heritage sites um, tend to think of their trip here as more memorable because they're learning things about the area and it provides that sense of connection to the area for them. So a little, some site preservation basics. And the first thing, if you have a site along your trail and you want to interpret it, the first thing to take in mind is whether or not it's been properly documented. The Florida master site file is a statewide inventory of all cultural and heritage sites in Florida. This includes archeological sites, trails, um, think rails to trails, for example, there are historic trails. Um, anything, historic structures, things of that nature, cemeteries that um, are historic resources in the state of Florida. Before you, rec before you interpret it for the public, it's really important to have it on um, file with the Florida Master Site file, just because if that's how the state knows it exists. The state can't be expected to protect something. The local municipality can't be expected to protect something if they don't know that it exists. Uh, there, right now, there are over 237,000 uh, listings on the Florida Master Site file, and it's important to note that this does not, I mean, obviously, these, pro these sites particularly may be on state or municipal land, but uh, it doesn't do anything as far as what you can or cannot do to the land itself. It's just essentially a listing. Um, and if you have any questions about the Florida Master Site file, all of our staff at FPN can assist you with that. Um, and we can help you list your site or see if it is or is not already on the Florida master site file. Uh, when, when it comes to archeology, span context matters. Um, the things that we find, the artifacts are very, very cool and awesome, but it's the story they tell that we really want to get at with archeology. span And that's what we can use to interpret the site. Otherwise it's just a bunch of things and we can tell you what those things are 
but knowing how those things relate to the human story is what we're trying to get at. So in protecting the sites, we want to do what we can to keep that context intact. And that means um, keeping people on trails, uh, monitoring erosion, uh, understanding how people accessing that site is impacting that site, um, providing trash receptacles and especially pet waste stations are really important, not just to the way the site looks, but uh, it can create contamination to the site. Uh, garbage, we often find modern garbage at archeological sites and in time, it gets buried and mixed in with the archeological material. And we do not want that because um, that messes with the context. Um, accessibility considerations. A lot of times people visiting your site may not utilize your entire trail. So having parking, making sure you, know, you take into consideration ADA, things of that nature, and also how that would impact the site. It's a constant balancing act with historic sites and interpreting them for the public. And also when you have a site interpreted for the public, there will be at least some impact. Uh, so have some protocols in place for unexpected finds that may include having signage that says, if you find anything, this is who you contact. And if there are storms or if looting does happen and there is damage to the site, having some type of protocol in place for what to do if that happens is really, really important. And it's important to have that in place before it happens, because then it's not such a crazy, uncontrolled situation. So when you are looking at a site and you want to interpret it for the public, again, defining the area where the public can and cannot go. This may include marked trails, paved trails, fencing, things of that nature. And um, when it comes to interpretation, I have found a lot of sites they kind of think of it as a one and done situation. They put out their cool signs and then they're like, okay, we're done. Uh, it's a constant thing. Um, you want to provide quality interpretation. And I often say, if you're not going to provide quality interpretation and maintain it, then don't provide it at all. Because we've all been to those parks where there's mold and mildew growing on the signs or they're cracked or they're not accurate. They look dated and it looks worse than if there was nothing at all. So please provide quality interpretation, uh, consider funding and the costs for maintaining and updating those interpretive materials. Archeology span changes. Uh, as we do research, we learn more about the past. So it's not stagnant. So you can expect to have to eventually update your interpretive displays, whether it be brochures, whether it be simple placards, whatever it is, you're probably going to have to update it eventually. So please keep that in mind when you're budgeting for this. It's not a one and done kind of thing. Also provide rules for the public. We cannot expect them to just know what to do if we don't tell them what to do. People are coming to Florida from all over the world, all over the country where there are different rules, there are just different customs and there's different value placed on history. So we don't, want to just assume everybody's going to have their best intentions and that their best intentions look like our best intentions. So uh, provide the rules for the public. It doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be intimidating. Simply just letting people know what they can and cannot do is usually enough. Um, you can state the statutes. You can just put, please, if you find something, call this number. And it's an opportunity to educate people, not just what the rules are, but why they exist. Um, if you have the room on your interpretation, uh, talk about context, talk about general archeological science and things like that. People find it fascinating. Um, accuracy matters though. So please <laughs> make sure whatever you're posting is accurate. And if rules or laws or ordinances change, please keep those up to date. Um, and it's important to note that not all sites are good candidates for public interpretation. Um, oftentimes I say that it's great to have the public out at sites because they do end up self-policing them a little bit. Um, but if you as staff can't get monitors out there regularly, 
if you find that it is being looted, if you find that it's just too far away or there's dam or damage or hazards to it, then maybe consider another site. And that's okay. We don't have to interpret everything. Um, and also, you don't always have to note the exact location of a site in order to uh, interpret it or let people know what was happening in that area. My favorite example is the Rails to Trails program. Obviously, at the beginning of the trailhead, you can just say this is a Rails to Trails. This is what Rails to Trails programs are. And this is the history of this particular railroad. Um, so just having some general information is interesting as well. So it doesn't have to be super specific and it doesn't have to even be at the location of that site. You can say along this trail, such and such happens um, or along this trail as you're walking, you'll find you possibly might find this, that or the other. And that's adequate. That's fine. It just depends on the situation and the site. So Encouraging appreciation through education is what FPAN is all about. And every organization can do this. Um, again, accurate, up-to-date, good condition displays are always good. You can even just have brochures. Uh, often uh, people are leaning towards QR codes on their interpretive displays. And it's a great way to update old interpretive displays because you can provide digital content. You can see at the Ice House Ruins, all they did, that looks like an older sign, but all they did is they added a QR code at the top so you can lead your visitor to more information through web-based and virtual-based uh, interpretation. And that's easier to update and usually less expensive than creating and purchasing new signage. And I know we're all about trying to get people off of their phones when they're out in nature, I get it. <laughs> but people aren't. <laughs> we just, instead of fighting it, let's lean into it a little bit and use it to our advantage. Um, digital content broadens your audience. It provides accessibility for people who may not be able to visit the site itself, right? They can Google it and go, come across that information that way as well. And it's a great promotional tool. I know a lot of times through our Facebook and social media, we try to promote other organizations, events, and things like that. And if they have digital content, it's much more engaging for the people that are interacting with us through our social media. So those tend to get more hits. Um, also, another thing I've seen really cool, I mentioned monitoring your sites regularly. And a lot of land managers are strapped for time, money, and staff right now. So why not utilize the public as a way to monitor these sites? And one way to do that is through photo stations where you set up, you can see it in the bottom corner there, you set up a little photo station where they're taking a photo from a spot that you know of, and then they can post it on Facebook or Instagram or what have you with a certain hashtag. And you can add the hashtag into the, uh, photo station, or you can ask them to tag you. And so from the comforts of your desk <laughs> with your cell phone, you'll be getting photographs in real time of what that site looks like at that particular moment. So it's a great source of information for you. It engages your visitors and it can be used as a promotional tool because they're posting it on social media and people can see what's going on. And we have had a lot of success with these um, at different parks and different sites. And they're also uh, being used for climate change monitoring of coastal sites and things like that to see how things change after a storm or before a storm. So you're getting real-time information that you can use as a baseline to get actual data on how things are occurring. So I've mentioned monitoring and one program I think would be that would be very beneficial for trail managers and those interested in uh, trails is what we call our Heritage Monitoring Scouts Program or HMS. We train uh, park visitors, site visitors, volunteers to go out and do non-invasive archeological monitoring. And we do this, um, they take, it, they sign an ethics statement and everything, and then they go out 
and they monitor these sites on a regular basis. And this is something that we can do for all of you. Uh, just contact your local FPAN office. There's also the cemetery resource protection training. If you have cemeteries along your trail, that's something that may interest you. It's a day long training. We also do interpretive trainings, disaster planning workshops. Again, it's best to have a plan in place before the disaster occurs. And then another thing I always like to say is a lot of these trails go through smaller communities or there's a local society, like a historical society or a citizen support organization that is really interested in that trail. Utilize them, utilize them as volunteers, utilize their venues for programming outside of your trail to kind of promote your trail and attract new visitors. Uh, we do a lot of programs at libraries and a lot of those libraries, I can think of example, the Woodville Library just south of Tallahassee is right off of the St. Mark's Trail. Um, so having a presentation on the St. Mark's Trail at that library would be beneficial and would probably draw a new audience. And then of course we at FPAN can provide interpretation design assistance. If you need help creating a brochure or creating that digital content or creating a sign, we're happy to help with that. And there's also grants available for that through um, the Division of Historical Resources so they can help you as well. And just some resources and a funny meme I thought was hilarious about trail guides. Um, a little humor, but uh, the master site file, the Florida master site file link is here, as well as um, the state heritage trails. Um, you'd be surprised some of your locations may already be listed in that brochure and you not even know it. And the Trail of Florida Indian Heritage is a great organization that I encourage you to get involved with. If you do have a Native American site uh, on your trail and um, they are wonderful, they will promote your organization, they will promote your site, they do uh, workshops and things of that nature occasionally as well. Um, so with that, I am finished. I know we're leaving questions till the end. So if you have questions, write them down and I will hand it off. Yeah, thank, so thank you, you so much, Barbara. It was great to hear from you. And I'm sure we will have some questions about these great resources that you've provided. Um, and I can also send out your PowerPoint after this if you want people to be able to click those links that you had on that last slide. Um, of course. Great, awesome. Um, like I said, we'll probably circle back to some of those ideas once um, we're at the end, but we're gonna move on to Anissa's presentation. Again, she's with the Randall Research Center, part of the Florida Museum, um, managing the Calusa Heritage Trail. So she's gonna go into a little bit about her work with that and how she implements maybe some of these um, best practices that Barbara was talking about. So Anissa, it is all yours. I can see it now, yes, thank you. Okay. I appreciate that. So once again, happy Archaeology Month, everybody. Uh, thank you so much um, for inviting me to speak to you today about the Calusa, um, about the Calusa and about the Randall Research Center. Um, as Anna told you at the beginning, I, we are part of the Florida Museum of Natural History. And uh, today I'd like to provide a little bit of insight about how we know what we know about the Calusa. And what Barbara was talking about is really uh, really relevant because it is not just the artifacts and the archaeological um, entities that we find in the ground. It's what we find out about them that tell us about the Calusa that is so interesting. Uh, but first, let me say that, you know, I was educated here in the state of Florida. And when I went to school back in the 1900s and I was learning about indigenous people, we were taught that when Juan Ponce de Leon discovered Florida, he basically came upon a place that was almost uninhabited and very few people, or that was the implication back then. It was really difficult to understand the way that the information was provided, um, that there were thriving people here. So if we can go to the next slide, you'll see the um, map of uh, the state of Florida. And in fact, we know that when Juan Ponce de Leon got to Florida in 1513, there were probably over 100,000 people here uh, that belong to many different organized um, tribes. Um, and many of these um, tribes interrelated with each other. They tr traded with each other. They had a system of 
communication, they had a system of transportation, they had a system of um, economy, certainly, they had barter systems, and so they were all in their own way living um, kind of like we are today with the same types of systems, both political and socially complex systems. Um, it is difficult, however, uh, when you're talking about a culture like the Calusa um, to um, estimate things like population size. Um, but we do know that these cultures and these civilizations included people um, who went, you know, who did more than just subsist. They went into um, engineering. They were artists. They were, um, the, the things they were able to accomplish, quite frankly, are awe-inspiring. The, with the tools they had, what they were able to, excuse me, accomplish um, is pretty amazing. And if we could go to the next slide, we can see that um, the Calusa were, in fact, one of the most powerful tribes in Southwest Florida. Today, we have remnants of this ancient civilization in the form of shell mounds and in the form of uh, remnants of canals that they dug. But we know that they were able to be so successful because they understood um, that the estuary on which they lived provided a lot of the food and resources that they needed. So the primary source of their food came from the water, not from the land. And so they were able to use shellfish and fish um, and aquatic animals, certainly terrestrial animals as well, to build their lives. Uh, what they did with the shells and the fish bones actually is quite interesting. They built shell mounds. They built um, walls and water ports. They were able to thrive um, because they used the refuse um, in a really beneficial way. The shell mounds are basically their landfills, but they were able to use these landfills in really beneficial ways. Um, in the bigger context, the Calusa were an exerting force, not only in Southwest Florida, but throughout the state. They traded um, all over the state. And in fact, they had trade routes that went all over um, the Caribbean and um, Eastern North America. We find remnants of um, these trade routes when we do these archaeological digs and we find these amazing finds, right? So we have, we know that um, in uh, Southwest Florida, we are finding in some of our archaeological digs, we find things like metals, which really didn't exist. Um, and they couldn't have existed in that time unless there was trade with another place. We know that lightning whelks that the Calusa revered so much um, in terms of spirituality has been found in other states, inland law, landlocked states. Um, and these whelks that weren't there naturally, uh, but it was the Calusa that um, probably started that trade route. So um, as we move forward, we start to understand that the Calusa not only were able to live in these estuaries, but really thrive because of them. Uh, as we go to the next slide, you'll see um, kind of a little focus of here in Southwest Florida. So you see these rivers coming together, the Calusahatchee River, the Peace River, the Mayaka River, and they come together in these um, protected waters. And so you have this mixture of salt and fresh water, which creates brackish water. This protection of this water from the barrier islands now provides an amazing nursery for a lot of aquatic animals. And we know today that estuaries are one of the most biologically productive uh, ecosystems on earth. And uh, whether or not the Calusa know, knew that uh, then, we don't know. But we do know that they were able to take advantage of that amazing biological productivity. So uh, you will see on this map, um, the, the towns of Fort Myers and Punta Gorda just for, uh, and Cape Coral, just so you can kind of get your bearing. Um, but you'll also see something else on this map. It says Tampa. Um, and in parentheses underneath, it says Pineland. Well, this is this is also a pretty interesting story. In the days of this, the Calusa, Pine Island or Pineland was actually known as Tampa. That was the original and correct name of Pineland. And early map makers noted this area of Florida as Tampa until about 1683. That was the last map we see with this area of Florida labeled as Tampa. And then sometime in the early 1700s, someone made a mistake, a map maker made a mistake, and the town or the city known as Tampa was moved north on the map. Um, and it is, it, it is where we know of Tampa as today. Tampa St. Pete, um, where we think of it today, is really not where Tampa was originally placed on the map. Um, but also on this 
uh, map, you can see that the uh, amazing estuary, these large areas uh, between Pine Island and North Captiva and Captiva Island, uh, Charlotte Harbor, these are all really, really protected waters. They're a mixture of salt and fresh water. These estuaries are nurseries for aquatic animals. And this is how and why we believe that the Calusa were able to be so successful. Not only the estuaries um, in this part of Southwest Florida, but the estuaries throughout Southwest Florida, where they were really able to take advantage of that mixture of salt and fresh water. Um, the Calusa then amalgamated that. They actually built canals where they were able to capture fish and hold shellfish, shellfish in water ports and preserve these, um, these lines of food. Um, as we move forward to the next slide, um, what we see there is what Brown's Mound looks like today. This is a shell mound that was left by the Calusa. And when the Calusa lived on Brown's Mound, it was much bigger. Um, but of course, when European settlers came in, a lot of what they needed to build their roads, to build their homes was contained in these mounds. It was, they looked at these mounds as fill. So uh, they they took down a lot of these mounds, but this complex, Brown's Mound Complex, was once a huge area on Pine Island and supported probably upwards of 500 uh, Native people. Um, we know that uh, this mound dates to about six, uh, 600 AD um, at the bottom and about uh, the 1700s at the very top. So it took over a thousand years to build this mound, but we don't think that they just wanted to build as high as they could. They actually lived on these mounds. So they would build up a little bit. We find layers of sand, we find layers of charcoal um, and they lived on these mounds. They probably had small home gardens and then they would build a little bit more. And so over time, over 1100 years, these mounds were built to incredible heights. Um, some of the most common trees we find on these mounds to, um, today were native trees that were definitely around back then. The gumbo limbo, the tree that we know in Southwest Florida and in, you know, in the tropical portions of our state with this reddish bark. Um, gumbo limbo we know um, was a part of their lives too. We, we see it as biologists today. We look at gumbo limbos as important parts of tropical hardwood hammocks. We know in our contemporary times, a lot of municipalities, especially in South Florida, use gumbo limbo as a parking lot tree. It's one of these things that they like to landscape with. But gumbo limbos, um, when they occur in their native hardwood hammocks, are incredibly important to migratory birds. Well, the Calusa used them too. And they had um, with them for 17 years a captive uh, named Fontaneda. And when he wrote his memoirs, he talked about the gumbo limbo as. Uh, the tree of many uses, el palo uh, para muchas cosas, right? And um, they, he kind of documented how the sap of this tree was used um, in medicine, and they believed that the tree could ward off evil spirits. Um, they were, um, you know, using these uh, ships to safeguard canoes from wood boring worms. Uh, the sap was used as glue and in many other ways. So we call it the tourist tree, but uh, it wasn't really for tourists back when the Calusa were here. It was really, it helped them um, sustain their way of life. Um, when we go to the next slide though, this is the image that we think of as the um, kind of what the Calusa uh, were like and what they represented. This image that you find when you Google Calusa was actually created by artist Merrill Clark for our site at Randall Research Center. And you can see the mounds that are depicted, the canal that's depicted on this image. It is because um, we had Frank Hamilton Cushing that came through in the late 1800s, came through Pine Island and saw these massive complexes of mounds. And on his way to Marco Island, he stopped. Uh, it was really serendipitous. He stopped at the end of a very, very cold winter. And when he got to the top of one of these mounds, he saw mounds all around him. And he realized that he was in a place that was very important to indigenous people. And so he, because he had his crew with him, he mapped all these mounds out and we have his maps. And so through those maps, we are able to create these artist, artistic renderings, or not, I'm not, uh, Merrill Clark did. Merrill Clark uh, created these illustrations to show us perhaps what Calusa life was like. And so when we look at these illustrations, we take 
a lot of information that was left from the writings of the Spanish, the writings of the English, um, and the artifacts that we find to create a, a picture of what it may have looked like uh, when the Calusa were still um, in control. We know that the Calusa were a politically complex um, society. When we uh, study Native Americans, when we study indigenous people, we are taught oftentimes that you have to have an agrarian society, a society that actually plants uh, manioc and maize and corn and other things to, to really be successful. Uh, but the Calusa did not plant rows and rows of crops. They had um, the ability to sustain themselves through their harvest uh, from the estuary. So they were fisher hunter gatherers but we know that they were extremely politically complex and socially complex from what we read um, from the Spanish accounts of their interactions. We know that here in Southwest Florida, the Calusa probably numbered upwards of 20,000 people. They were able to support an elite military fo um, force um, and they had principal leaders that created a monarchy based on heredity that we know uh, occurs in many other cultures around the world. They had a war captain and a head priest. Um, you know, they had a strong artistic tradition. They had elaborate spirituality. Many cultures around the uh, world um, in the past and even in contemporary times, there are many um, different types of religions and faiths. And certainly that also um, can be attributed to many Native American uh, peoples. They had a strong uh, spirituality that they believed in. And so they lived their lives much like we do. They had uh, certain things that they held in um, importance to them. And we know much of what we know, uh, not only from what the Spanish uh, left behind in terms of text, but also from Frank Hamilton Cushing's uh, life. Um, and, and sorry, uh, Frank Hamilton Cushing's um, discoveries, uh, his maps. Um, as we move forward to the next slide, um, we are reminded that the Calusa lived day-to-day -day life um, much like we do our own. They needed to uh, get water and food. They needed to sustain themselves. They needed to uh, take care of their children and take care of their society. Uh, when we read the Spanish accounts of the Calusa, oftentimes it is a very, um, it is biased. We know that, right? It, it is uh, the perspective of the person writing the uh, account. But we know from the uh, from Fontaneda, who lived with the Calusa for 17 years, that they they were not a contentious people. They were not warlike in their daily lives. Um, they uh, actually were able to uh, create and build these huge mounds and build these grand canals uh, so that they could um, not only take care of their community today, but they planned for the future. They knew that these canals were needed to. Um, serve as routes of transportation. They could also use these canals um, to gather large groups of canoes if they had to go on a trading route, uh, on a trading uh, venture, or even defend themselves. Um, we know from um, historic records that um, they did uh, take a lot from the sea. And so let's, let's go to the next, um, the next slide and we'll kind of talk about uh, how we know what we know. Uh, we know that these middens, these shell mounds, were uh, basically their landfill that they were able to uh, benefit from. They lived on top of them. But when we dig through them um, in a very systematic way um, through our digs, we find uh, some interesting things. We find that much of what they discarded were mollusks, um, shellfish, um, lightning whelks, conchs, um, and so we, we know that they, they use these not only as food, but they use them as tools as well. Uh, but as we dig deeper or as we kind of sift through our, um, sift through the middens a little bit more, we also find a lot of fish bones. And so when you come to the Randall Research Center or you go to another shell mound um, site, you will look at a, the mound and see shell, uh, shellfish, right? That's what you will see, clams, cohogs, uh, perhaps lightning whelks, but really the things you cannot see that are there, unless you really um, look closely, are these thousands and thousands of fish bones. And so through archaeological studies, we have found out that actually they ate a lot of fish, probably depending on where they lived, 
uh, between 50 to 80 percent of their diet was actually fish. The shellfish, the the refuse, right, that is left behind, the shells uh, that are left behind, they're just bigger than fish bones. And so for us, it kind of seems that maybe uh, shellfish were a larger part of their diet, but it really wasn't. We look at the fish bones that are left behind, and we and we know that um, that uh, fish were a large part of their diets. But these gastropods, these mollusks were really important as well. So we can go to the next slide and um, we can see that uh, the shells that we find really tell us a story about the environmental conditions and uh, the community in which the Calusa live. We look at these shells and then we start to determine the species of shell. We look at how big these shells are, how thick the walls are, compared to modern examples, and that tells us a little bit about the environmental conditions and the habitats in which these shells, these animals thrived or did not thrive. Um, we collect uh, these shells and we can tell through study uh, the types of salinity ranges that these shells existed in. Uh, we have information about sea level, about based on where these shells are collected. Um, and we can kind of tell when uh, the sea levels were higher and when they were lower based on where these shells are collected as well. This tells us a lot about the people that use these shells, the Calusa that use these shells. They created many tools from the shells that they uh, basically fed off of. So they ate the shells and then they used the shells many uh, times as tools. So let's go to the next slide and we can um, look at some examples of these uh, shell tools. You can see on the left this artist's depiction of a canoe, people riding in canoes, and uh, these canoes have to be created, had to be built, um, but because the Calusa couldn't, um, didn't have, rather, didn't have any uh, hard metals or hard stone, they had to create tools using shell and bone, and so oftentimes the shells that were found are, in archaeological excavations are um, shells that were used as tools. And you can see in the top right, there is a picture of a shell being used as an ax um, or uh, a, a way to chip away at wood. And you can, you might be able to tell, uh, depending on how big your monitor is, uh, that there is a stick that goes through that shell. Uh, we have found many shells that have that telltale hole um, and a straight line from one edge of the shell to the other. And that tells us that it was likely uh, used as a tool. We also know that boat building became a very prominent activity uh, between 800 and 1200 AD. And so um, using that information uh, based on the, the age of the shells we uh, see, we, we can also look at other historical facts and see that trade routes became really uh, important during that time as well. And so their ability to create these canoes and dig these canoes meant that they were able to fish and trade um, but it was because of their knowledge of the estuary that they were able to do that. And we can move on to the next um, slide and just take a quick look here at the types of environmental information we can glean from what we find. So on the left, you have a crested oyster. Um, it's usually found in greater salinities um, or times of drought. And so we know that when we find a lot of crested oysters, the environmental conditions are such where there are high salinities, perhaps um, little rainfall or perhaps drought um, conditions. And then if we are finding shells uh, like you might find on the right side of the screen, the Eastern oyster, we know that that's lower salinities, perhaps a lot of rainfall. Maybe it was times uh, where they were collecting far from the Gulf, closer uh, to fresh water. And so depending on the types of shells, the species, that we find in these middens, we can kind of tell where they are looking for food. And um, it allows us to ponder for a few minutes uh, what else they, they might be doing, the types of trade routes um, they were, um, that they were taking part in. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And you know we're back in the midden. I talked about all of these fish bones that we find in the midden. And, um, these bones tell us a lot about the way the Calusa were able to fish as well. And so um, not all fish are created equally. We know that the spotted sea trout on the top um, can live eight to 10 years. They live inshore in seagrasses and uh, you know they eat shrimp and small 
crabs, and so they can uh, die if the temperature gets colder than 58 degrees. We know that if we find a lot of these fish, that they were, that the Calusa were fishing in nearshore environments, that it was not very cold, um, that they were able to um, thrive in these warm waters means that the, they were eating these fish at a time where uh, the water was warm, and they can actually um, they can actually be caught by hook and line. Um, sometimes they get too big for nets, so they had to be caught on hook and line. And so we know the Calusa could do that. Um, the um, red drum uh, are golden in color. Um, they have a black spot on the tail, the very last one there. Um, and they're when, when they're young, they live inshore. Um, but when they get about four years old, they move offshore. So we can tell by the size of the fish bones, not only the species, but the age of the fish. And so that allows us to um, connect those dots and say, well, these fish, uh, these uh, life histories are living, um, are these fish bones are, are found here. And so we know that the Calusa were also able to fish offshore. That tells us a lot about what the Calusa did and how they were able to do it. And if you go to the next slide, this image was created for by Merrill Clark as well. And this is kind of an image that we have of the Calusa um, fishing by net. Um, and because of the large amount of fish bones we find uh, from fish that are caught by net, we know that um, stain netting or gill netting was very important to them. Um, but we also know that um, fishing was a large part of how they sustained themselves. They did not harvest from the land, they uh, harvested from the sea. Um, and very quickly, I wanna talk about in the next slide, um, I know I'm running a little bit over, I'm gonna talk about their trade routes and their, collect, uh, sorry, their connections. Uh, we know that they had uh, connections throughout North America. There are things that we find in uh, Southwest Florida that don't belong here geologically. They shouldn't be here. Uh, we have quartz crystals and galena and uh, quartzite that we have found um, here, uh, but we know that they didn't start here. And we have found likely, uh, sorry, alternately in those areas, we have found lightning whelks, um, which we know don't belong in those areas. So those types of uh, pieces of evidence tell us that the Calusa did have trade routes that were really, really important. Our next slide brings us back to Southwest Florida, and uh, this is a depiction of the political capital on Mount Key. Mount Key is a, an entire island made by the Calusa. It was not in existence until the Calusa built it up. And this artistic rendering um, shows us uh, kind of what uh, a political gathering may have looked like um, in the 1560s. Um, this is where uh, Pedro Menendez de Aviles meets the Calusa and quotes, um, gives, us, um, gives us information about how many people were able to be held in this building and how uh, there was a lot of singing and dancing. And so by the writings of the Spanish, again, we're told not only were these subsistence um, people, they had a huge uh, political and society, uh, social uh, society that allowed them to live beyond just food, water, shelter. They were able to uh, create a, a society that actually the, the Spanish were not able to subsume. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead to the next slide um, and show you some of the artwork that was left by the Calusa. So when Frank Hamilton Cushing came through Pine Island and made all of those drawings of those incredible mounds, he then went down to Marco Island. And when he went down to Marco Island, he discovered a lot of amazing things, masks and shells. Uh, on the bottom right, you see the Key Marco cat. In the middle, you see uh, the shell man. On the top right, you see this beaked sea turtle. Um, and so when Frank Hamilton Cushing went back to the Smithsonian with all of these artifacts that he found, um, he was actually, he was actually, um, accused of forgery because at that time the people at the Smithsonian and and it was kind of a a feeling that a lot of people had about indigenous people you know these savages could not represent themselves in art that's what they said to him and so he was accused of forgery but that kind of 
uh, tells us that our preconceived notions, and certainly we don't believe that, um, we would we would never say that, right? Um, but that was the, the notion at the time. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was this idea that indigenous peoples could not be as advanced uh, politically or socially or artistically as the Europeans were. And so um, when Frank Hamilton Cushing was accused of forgery and he uh, eventually was cleared, uh, that kind of gave us insight as to the types of thinking, right? It's the types of things. When we know better, we do better. When we find out more information, we are able to review, um, hopefully um, review and change the way we think about uh, things. And so as we go to the next slide, we know that um, the Calusa, you know, we always, the Calusa were one of the most complex and powerful societies in Florida. When we started uh, investigating indigenous people, when we started learning about indigenous people, I told you at the very beginning uh, that I was kind of given the impression when I was going to school that, um, you know, indigenous people didn't, there weren't a lot of them. And the only way a society could be advanced is if it was agrarian. Um, but for a long time, um, that's that's how people thought about it. When we met the Calusa, when we started learning about the Calusa, we started to understand that um, societies that relied on hunting and fishing, um, you know, they were not less advanced. They were actually equally um, skilled and equally complex as other as agrarian societies. Learning about the Calusa allowed us uh, as anthropologists, as archaeologists, as people who want to learn more about our heritage. Uh, here in the United States helped us to learn that um, they were actually a very, very advanced culture um, and that we should be able to look at the Calusa um, and, and not um, make assumptions about um, how they were able to live based simply on their lack of agrarian society. And my final slide um, is one that um, it really kind of brings it home. Their sophistication and their fierceness um, enable them to resist the Spanish and domination for over 200 years. So their sophistication, their ability to live their lives from what they harvested in the estuary and their ability to know what was going around, uh, going on in the world around them allowed them to resist the Spanish. Um, and with that, I would like to um, ask the, yep, the last slide. Uh, I'd, I'd like to invite you to come and visit the Randall Research Center at the Calusa Heritage Trail on Pine Island. Uh, right now, we only have a small portion of our trail open um, because of Hurricane Ian, but we're working to get larger portions open. We have about a thousand feet of a one mile trail open, uh, but if you're in the area, we'd love to see you. We're open every day from sunrise to sunset. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Anissa, for giving us some background um, about those resources and those people that you interpret there at the Calusa Heritage Trail. Um, we are going to open it up for questions now. Um, so we do have a little bit of time left. If you are watching and you have a question for either Anissa or Barbara, feel free to put that in the comments and we will read it. Um, but we do have a few to get started here. Um, this one would be for Anissa. How do you balance making sure that the cultural resources at the site and on the trail are protected while still letting the public explore and walk along that site? That's a great question. Um, part of it is is trust, right, that we have in the public that if they're coming, it's not easy to get to our site. You have to, unless you're already on Pine Island, it is a, quite a bit of a drive. So people that are coming to our site specifically for our trail um, are interested in the subject. We uh, try to have a greeter or a staff member there. So we try to do it with signs where we can, but we also like to have someone there to introduce the site to people who have never been there to um, kind of uh, relay the importance of the site to people. <clears throat> and we have signs along the way. So we try uh, to do it kind of um, with the ability to give people the, um, option of asking questions about the trail. Maybe uh, they're not sure. We do, it's a shell mound, right? We all go to the beach and we see people collecting shells on the beach. So sometimes that kind of behavior they think is okay at our site, but um, it's mostly with education. We, we have signage, but it's mostly about, hey, we're trying to protect the resource. We can't, you can't take shells off. So it's 
it's a combination of signs and having people there uh, to talk to the public. Great, thank you so much for answering that. Um, our next question, I think it could go to both of you. So maybe we'll start with Barbara and then hear from Anissa. But the question is, um, you kind of both talked about making sure you have accurate representations of what you're interpreting. Um, what are some good resources for a trail manager? Um, maybe they want new signs or maybe they don't have any interpretive resources at their site. What groups or organizations or resources would you point them to to make sure they're getting accurate information about whatever cultural thing they're interpreting? Sure, of course. Um, obviously, your local FPAN office would probably have more local resources for you. There's always the Florida Memory Project, which is a uh, web resource of historic documents, historic photos, really good for photos. I use it a lot. Um, it's managed by the uh, library and archives, the State Library and Archives. Very good resource for that kind of thing. Um, you also have the State Archives itself. Uh, your local historical societies are always a very, very valuable resource. They have a lot of documents that may not have been published, um, but that can be useful to you. Uh, the universities, state university systems, all of them have really um, wonderful archives and libraries as well. Um, but I would start by going to your local FPAN office and seeing what they might have available for you at a more localized level. That was going to be my first suggestion as well. Go to FPAN first. Um, it's um, the Florida Park Public Archaeology Network is a fantastic resource and the people like Barbara who work for them, um, they're, they're, they're um, very educated. They know what they're talking about. They have the ability to help you with research as well. And so um, I would say start with FPAN and also Florida Master Naturalist Program is now statewide. And a lot of people that have taken Florida Master Naturalist classes um, know about uh, interpretation, which is probably what your sign is aimed at doing. Not only do you want it to be accurate, but you want it to be effective as an interpretive tool. So I would say um, if you, a lot of us um, have uh, a lot on our plates right now. And so to develop a really nice uh, sign or set of signs, it takes a little bit of time. So I would say go to FPAN, maybe get a Florida Master Naturalist volunteer to help you out and um, coordinate with someone at a local university or a state university on this subject matter. Um, and then I would find, um, I can't recommend, um, you know, a sign maker, perhaps you might want to uh, talk to people about the types of signs they've used. But in Florida, we need to make sure that our signs last. They're not cracked. They don't get moldy. And some um, some of these vendors have uh, actually not mastered, but they're getting pretty good at making sure these signs last a long time. So you might want to ask folks in your locality who they use, find a sign you like, and then find out who they use to make that sign. There's also some really good resources through the uh, National Association of Interpretation. There's uh, Sam Ham. He is a professional interpreter, author. He has some great books out if you're interested in learning about uh, not only design, like the placement of things on your actual interpretive signage or brochure, but also interpretive theory and methods to kind of get your message across in a mean meaningful way to the public. So that's a good resource as well. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective on that um, and giving people a little bit of an idea of where they can start with something like this. Um, and we are running out of time, but we're going to just go with one last question. Um, and I know if anyone has to log off, no worries, this is being recorded. Um, so the last question, and again, maybe both of you might talk to this, um, maybe Anissa would start because it might be more relevant. Um, what does making a trail on a historical site like the Calusa Heritage Trail, how does that bring people closer to understanding the Calusa people or in any case, whatever cultural resource there is versus the same information maybe in a museum exhibit? How does the trail really highlight that resource in your experience? We all have different ways of learning. We all have different ways of um, having that aha moment, right? You might have had a teacher in school that explains something to you, meiosis and mitosis and all that stuff, you know, maybe you didn't understand it until someone else explained it in a different way. Um, at the Calusa Heritage Trail, and we know this um, for other 
archaeological sites around the state, when people are walking on the same places that indigenous people were, walked on for thousands of years, it 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 show it, the the environment is all around them, right? They're listening to the same species of birds that the Calusa listen to. They they're smelling the same salt air, likely that the the Calusa. You know, the environment is exactly the same, so it allows for a deeper connection. They're seeing the same butterflies. They're seeing the same maybe plants. Um, all of that has a way to bring people uh, more into the story and understand more um, the experiences. Not the no, not the experiences, but perhaps a snapshot of what it felt like to be there on that day. Uh, that might have been the same 100 or you know 150 years ago. Great, Barbara. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, I would second what Anissa said and add that it provides unique interpretive opportunities when that people are actually in the environment. It's a little bit more immersive. Like Anissa said, you know, you can mention things like these are the same species of trees that would have existed and this is how people utilize them. And it provides them with just a little bit more immersion. Now there's definitely a place for museums. I'm not saying that there isn't because like Anissa said, people learn in different ways. And of course in Florida, our weather is very unpredictable so museums are great places for you know rainy day activities and things like that so and a lot of times if you have a trail you can kind of play off that as well you can connect with the local museums and perhaps network with them and say hey i know it's rainy but you can go to this museum and they have an exhibit on what you're seeing here and things like that so it's an opportunity to network as well Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us and providing your expert insight on these topics um, and helping us celebrate Florida Archaeology Month here um, at the Office of Greenways and Trails. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up for today. Thank you again, Barbara and Anissa, um, for your great presentations. And thank you, everyone, who is able to tune in with us live. Um, I'll be sending out a survey about our webinar today, along with the link to the recording in the next few days. Um, we do have sign-ups open through June for our uh, future Outdoor Florida webinars. You can sign up for those on our website, floridadep.gov slash OGT. If you have any questions about today's webinar or any follow-up questions for our presenters, reach out to us at Office of Greenways and Trails at floridadep.gov, and we will connect you or get you the answers. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.